Good morning. Today I'd like to use as a sermonic theme, don't quit. Don't quit. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord. May we hear, may we be nourished, and may we be inspired to move forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, I had the opportunity to attend the United Church of Christ Council for Racial and Ethnic Minorities Convocation 2022. I couldn't have said that unless I read it. (laughs) A lot of words. Under this umbrella are the Native American indigenous people, the Samoans, Pacific Islanders, Asians, Latinos, and African Americans. They had not met in over 10 years. And instead of doing what is called workshops, they did a series of town hall meetings. And in the very last one that I was able to attend, it was called Welcoming the LGBTQ. We were divided into groups, and so they arranged the chairs in a circular way, like so about six people could sit in each group. And as I entered the room, I don't know if they were trying to model welcoming, (laughs) they would sort of direct you to a group. In my group, because this was an intergenerational conference, we're all adults, but there was one young adult of Asian heritage. She seemed a little bit awkward in her skin beyond the whole, you know, adolescent uh, kind of thing. I felt a disease, a dis-ease. And then I noticed it, her arm. She kind of folded her hand in a way that she made sure that her clothing would cover her arm. But every now and then, her sweater would move, and I noticed that her arm was severely deformed. It was super, super big. And I wondered for her what it must be like for a teenager with such a deformity. I remember a professor saying, often we ignore the invisible illnesses and challenges, but for those that it's visible, this young girl's arm, even with her sweater on, could not be ignored. Today, we're giving a lot of colorful characters, but the main character is Naaman. Can you say that with me? Naaman. (laughs) Naaman has a visible illness like this girl called leprosy, which is different from our understanding of leprosy today. Naaman commanded the army of Aram, also known as Syria today, and was himself a mighty warrior. He had a reputation as being a man of physical strength and personal charisma, but he was a leper, a condition that made him ceremonially unclean, thereby being judged and perhaps being socially isolated. Without the advances of medicine that we have often been given today, his illness was treated with suspicion. People like him were labeled and isolated. Touching Naaman would make somebody else unclean, just as touching a dead body. Leopards were marked and excluded so that they would not transmit this ritual impurity. Generally, where there is ignorance, people do not know, we will decline to be our worst selves. In Africa, albinos are killed because there is a belief that their body parts have potions that can bring good luck and wealth. During COVID, this practice actually increased, says the United Nations. One colleague says, before we had one universal health care, that the next thing on the agenda must be education, that we must educate people. There was so much medical knowledge that we have now that was not available to our ancestors in the Old Testament. Different is often been determined as deficient. And so when Naaman's wife assistant, AKA slave, AKA property of pre-war says, I know someone who can heal you, Naaman's hope is turned over like a juicy, thick Angus beef steak. I am this great leader, but what if I were healed of my skin condition? 
The slave assistant, no name, helps the wife woman hold out a possibility of looking the part, not just doing the part, but looking. She whets his appetite for healing. And just like that, Naaman leaps. He leaps forward. In college, I was walking to lunch one day with some friends. We were near the dining hall when there on the ground was a $10 bill. Now, this was over 20 years ago, so put a little inflation in the figure. And my classmate in front of me transformed into Superman as she lunged in the air, swooping down to get the $10 bill. And just as her hand was less than a second away, the $10 disappeared. Over in the bushes were some guys, and what they had done was tied a thin string to the $10 bill. They had set up camp to play this prank on poor college students. On that day, we laughed. Oh, boy, did we laugh. We crippled over laughing at her. I was only glad that she had spotted it first so that she was the one that the joke was on. But she reminds me today of Naaman in this instant, lunging for the hope that he could be healed, dashing, turning it over in his head, even going to his king to toss the idea in the air, letting it breathe, giving it air, possibility. As much as he was a great leader, he also was a leper, and this bothered him, being judged for something that he could not help. This mighty warrior who brought successes to the king is so esteemed that when he approaches the king, the king says, let me write you a letter of recommendation to the king of Israel. Now let's pause a minute and catch you up. So thus far we know Naaman. Okay. <laughs> so thus far we know Naaman is a mighty warrior. And we know he suffered from a visible skin condition. But Naaman is also the enemy of Israel. Naaman, in short, commands the forces who have brought violence, loss of life, homes, and livelihood, and untold suffering to the people of Israel. And now his own king must enter into a quasi-truce to send across the enemy lines Naaman looking for a cure. The cure for Naaman is in the enemy territory. So like a parent was saying her job, wanted to send her to this conference, a friend of mine was telling me that her job said, hey, go to this conference. And then she says, well, where is the conference? And they say, oh, it's in Poland, close to the border of Ukraine. And she's like, no thanks, I pass. So sort of like this, Naaman is being sent to a community that may be just a little bit hostile toward him. He's being sent to a household asking and looking for a cure. He brings with him 1,000 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 suits of clothing, huge treasure. And he comes with an entourage consisting of horses and chariots. He comes with a procession of power. The man who rolls up in front of the king's house that afternoon, horses tossing their head, chariots gleaming, boxes of silver and gold is ready to buy a cure, is accustomed to bows of honor and unquestioning obedience. If there is a prophet in Israel power enough to heal him, Naaman definitely has the money to buy it. He has the power to persuade. And so he shows up at the king of Israel's door. Holy cow, nearly has a heart attack. The king, the king of Israel's like, what? You gotta be kidding me. Is this some kind of awful joke? Even though he sees Naaman before him, he remembers the prophet Elijah with a J, ability to heal. But that guy has vanished, stranger things. So the king looks at him again like, He's in shock. Like, how could you come to me and ask me for a cure? The king is paranoid for obvious reason. He thinks that King Aram is up to something and setting him up. 
It's bad enough they're declining in power. It's bad enough they're getting their butts whipped. But now you want me to cure Naaman? I got 99 problems and you're trying to make this triple digits. Word gets out or around to Elijah with a S, not a J, Elijah's successor. And he sends word, I will help him, tell him to come here. All of this information is transmitted through another blue collar minimum wage worker. So it wasn't just Naaman, but all of his treasures and those carrying his treasures that now turn and make this pilgrimage where the lowly Elijah with the S is living. And when he finally gets to Elijah, Elijah does not even greet him. Elijah doesn't come out of the house. He sends word through another person to go to the water and cleanse himself. It's Naaman's turn to get upset. You mean I didn't travel all this way? I didn't cross over the enemy lines? I am the leader of my army. I have wealth that could set you straight for the rest of your life, and you can't even speak to me? And now you want me to go to a river? We have better rivers where I live. You want me to go to a river? The absurdity of the request was too much for Naaman. Take your river. Take your advice. You know what you can do with it? You can shove it. And Naaman gives up. He's ready to go home. This is ridiculous. And yet again, another blue collar minimum wage worker says, hey, you've come this far. Somebody needs to hear this. You've passed your way this long. You've come this far. You've been on the battlefield for your Lord this long. You've been trying to live a life of faith this long. You've been trying to do the right thing for this long. You've been trying to fight for justice this long. You have been traveling for some time. You have been fighting for freedom this long. You have been an advocate for those who were dealt an unjust hand this long. You have been a voice for the voiceless this long. Man, why don't you just do what the man says and go get in the river? What you got to lose? Even now, every now and then, we're asked to do something that just doesn't make sense. For some reason in this moment when the blue college wage worker speaks to Naaman, he does it. He goes to the river, he washes himself, and he is healed. We didn't come this far to turn back. Novelist Rennie Grand tells this story of her dad leaving home to make money in another country. After eight years in America, he returns home. She doesn't know him. When he says, hey, baby, she looks at him because she does not know this man. But after the days of him being with her, she realizes she loves this man. This is her papa. And then papa makes the announcement that I'm going to take your oldest siblings and we're going back to America. And she says to papa, take me. And papa says, baby, you're too young. You can't make the track. But she pleads with her papa. You've been gone for eight years. I don't know how long you'll be gone the next time. And her papa takes her and her three siblings. And she realizes along the journey that papa was right. She is way too young to walk this long. And they go across the desert and they get caught and they're returned home. And they do this a couple more times and each time they're caught and they're returned home. And you would think that they would give up. But the dad turns to his kids and says, let's change our strategy. Every time we've gone across the desert, we've gone in the daytime. Let's go at night. And so at night, they start walking across the desert, but they can't see. And they're holding each other's hands. And when morning comes, they are in California. Sometimes it feels like we take one step forward only to take two back in our courts, in our Supreme Courts, in our country, the rip, the tear. Martin Luther King says, we got some difficult days ahead. Don't quit. Mother Teresa says, we can't always do great things, but we can do little things with great love. Don't quit. 
Grande's papa didn't quit. Like broken water pots, living out our faith, watering someone else's, we can't quit now. What stands out to me in this text is how close Naaman was to being healed when he gave up. He was close to the river when he decided this is some nonsense, this is some craziness. Have you ever gotten lost only to discover later how close you were to the promised land? He almost let obstacles turn him around. He almost gave up. Obstacles in the text today are ego. Ego is an obstacle. Fear is an obstacle. Paranoia is an obstacle. Entitlement, privilege, wealth are obstacles. Being offended is an obstacle. Not knowing where to go, where to turn, obstacle. Obstacles sometimes cause us to give up. You might feel the obstacles and you might be tempted to give up. I'm tired. And sometimes one of the biggest obstacles is, guess what? Us. Today I began with a story about a girl and her severely deformed arm. Our obstacles and our struggles are visible. Most people know what our weaknesses are, don't they? That's how we know how to trigger one another, right? So was Naaman's obstacles visible. Being great doesn't exempt us no matter how good or perfect we are. Obstacles come and your obstacles may look different from my obstacles and my obstacles may look different from yours. Your hill to climb might be different from somebody else's. You may feel unprepared for this journey. You may not have the answer, but all God ever asked anyone to do was take one step, just one step. Utilize our faith. Just go wash in the river. Just get up and follow me. Just take one step and I'll take two. Just help a neighbor out. Just keep your heart open. Just get down on your knees and pray. Just take one step. That's exactly what some of us did last Sunday at the Pride Parade. There were over 100 people marching for the church saying, God is proud of you. And all it started out with was one step. Now, when I got to about the, the 300th step, I was like, Lord, <laughs> where's the end? But just one step. It was beautiful being in this parade. And as we watched down the street, 100 people from the church, people were yelling and shouting. And let me tell you, I've been to many gatherings, but not one where I felt so much love for humanity flowing back and forth. And for those few hours, it felt like we were on the right side of Jesus' ministry, embracing others. When is the march going to end? Charlene, just one more step. United, just one more step. Marsha, just one more step. Cal, just one more step. Mary Lynn, just one more step. June, just one more step. Billy, just one more step. Denise, just one more step. Edith, just one more step. Josiah, Kai, just one more step. Deb. Helen, just one more step. Marsha, just one more step. One more step. And now I know why we cannot quit. I know why we cannot quit. Because the future needs us right now. Don't quit. Amen.